Pet Life Radio. This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Hello and welcome to Six Figure Dog Business on PetLifeRadio.com. Now, this is the show where we help you start or grow your pet-related company to a healthy six-figure per year or more income. Now, I'm excited today because we've got somebody on with a bunch of data for us and uh, a big brain talking with us today. Stay with us because we're going to come back with Adrian Tennant, who is the Vice President of Insights at Big Eye, a big advertising agency in Orlando, Florida. So stay right with us. We'll be right back. D-I-N-O-V-I-T-E.com. When we put him on the Dynavite, he took right to it. All of these symptoms disappeared. Dynavite is nutrition. If you want the dog to be healthy, you got to feed it something healthy. Something that he actually likes to eat. You need to put him on Dynavite. Dynavite for life. If you love your dog, you don't just want him healthy, you want him to be happy. You won't believe how happy your dog will be. D-I-N-O-V-I-T-E.com. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. All right, guys. Well, first off, today we've got a guest with us. His name is Adrian Tennant. So first off, welcome to the show, Adrian. Thanks for being with us today. Hey, thank you very much for having me, Ty. I appreciate it. Now, you're Vice President of Insights at Big Eye. Did I get that right? You did. We're an audience-focused, creative-driven, full-service advertising agency. Uh, We're based out of Orlando, Florida, but we serve clients across the United States and beyond. Do you have a, a particular niche that you work in, or do you work with all different types of businesses? We do work with um, the six kind of key verticals that we work with. And most interested probably to your listeners is we do a lot of work in the pet care space, which is really what motivated us to do this uh, research earlier this year. Okay. Yeah. And and here in a second, I want to talk about this, this study that you guys just put out. But I did have a question. You're vice president of insights. What does that mean, insights? Ah, that's a great question, Ty. Thank you. So in this role, I am responsible for essentially providing research to our clients and to our agency partners. So that means I'm the guy who undertakes um, quantitative studies. That means basically numbers-based stuff, uh, but also qualitative research. So I'm interested in understanding consumers how they buy, what they buy, why they buy, that kind of good stuff. Um, And also look at the different ways in which advertising can nudge them towards behavior change or purchase type. So it's uh, really to provide some kind of creative juice, if you like, that then fuels the rest of the process uh, of an advertising agency. Awesome. So you guys have recently come out with a study. As a company, do you do a lot of studies? Is this a big part of, of how your company operates? You know, it's an emerging part. Um, I joined the company earlier this year, and it was really my remit to uh, do more research for us. So um, this is the first in what will be a series of studies. Uh, Super exciting and uh, absolutely great to have the opportunity to conduct our own primary research rather than relying exclusively on other people's research, right? Yeah, I mean, because I see the same research quoted every time I look for different stats in the pet arena. I see all sorts of research and it's the same research quoted over and over. It's very broad strokes. It's like the pet industry is worth $63 billion and blah, blah, blah. And it's all very, you know, very broad and, and general. And so I'm excited to dig into this study with you. Does the study have a name? Like, tell me a little bit about the name of the study and what was kind of the premise of what you guys were doing. Right, absolutely. So it's called uh, the 2019 U.S. Pet Industry Study. And the reason behind the thinking behind the study for sure was really to find at a more granular level combinations of data that might help our clients uh, and people hopefully like including your listeners um, that are looking for more actionable information to kind of guide them somewhat into you know where is the best place uh, to advertise what kinds of new products they might be thinking about is it a good time to launch a subscription service those kinds of things so uh, essentially insights that provide uh, some direction and some guidance to help a, a business kind of move to the next level 
Okay. And we're going to link to the study. So for those that are listening right now in the show notes, you're going to have access to the study. Um, but I want to get into it with you and kind of get your insight into what this study was. So I'm sure you guys found a bunch of things, but was there an overarching takeaway that you guys got out of this study? It's really hard to summarize just one thing because there were a lot of things in this study. Um, and I hope the listeners will take a, a moment to go over and, and take a look for themselves. Absolutely. I mean, we've often heard it said that a dog is man's best friend. This study really underlined that point. You know, we asked whether owners consider their pets members of the family. A whopping 95% of our respondents said, yes, they consider pets a member of their family. And that really influences our buying behaviors when shopping for our dogs, right? And thinking about products and services. And so let me dig a little bit deeper in that. So 95% said, and you might not have this right offhand, but maybe you, you have an idea. What was the question that led to that? Was it just that exact question? Do you consider your pet as a member of the family? Or were there multiple questions around that that, that kind of led you to understand that? No, we actually asked the question specifically. Um, we gave people, they could answer, um, they could make a, a single selection. And uh, yeah, it was it came back to 95% of people were agreeing with that absolutely or somewhat. So we, we bucketed them together. But as we think about the answers that we saw from the rest of the survey questions, a lot of the responses kind of supported that idea. And I think overall, you'll see there is a move towards uh, more of a kind of a humanization of our pets and the younger the respondent the more likely they were to be engaged really kind of engaged pet parents so as we'll, we'll probably get into this but you know most likely to be involved in subscription services and purchasing multiple products for their pets and actually spending quite a bit more than the average consumer so some uh, really actionable insights to come uh, that's great so my business, we own a, a dog training company. We've yep. got multiple locations around the country. And I've been in the industry since the mid-90s. And I can, I like seeing this in data form because I remember in the mid-90s when I was, I was young, I was just getting into dog training. At the time, I don't know, half of our clients maybe, I worked for a dog trainer when I was in high school. Half of our clients maybe, like their dogs lived outside. Their dogs had a dog house in the yard. Their dogs maybe came inside sometimes, maybe not. But I, you know, just looking back on that, those people, if you would have asked them, is the dog a member of the family? They would have been like, oh, we love our dog, but no, he's, he's you know, he lives outside. And, and, and so this speaks to a trend that I think is decades in the making where people are starting to see the dog less as, as this, this accessory that lives outside and more as a mm -hmm. family. Or, would you agree with that? Oh, I absolutely would. So, you know, very specifically talking about dog owners, and we, we asked the question, has your pet influenced where you've chosen to live? And 60.4% of the dog owners said it absolutely had. I want, you to just, really? I want you to just think about that for a second. 60.4% of all dog owners in our study said that their pet had influenced where they've chosen to live. I imagine that would extend to, you know, because they're renting a home and where they're going to rent yep. the home or the apartment or maybe something to do with location to parks and stuff like that. Is that what you think it yep. is? I do. Interestingly, you know, I looked at the whole bedding issue. 34.8% of respondents are buying bedding for their dogs as well. Uh, but a significant number of them, you know, are actually sleeping on the owner's bed these days. So if they don't have a, have a designated space, then the answer is the bed, the owner's bed. So I don't know how that compares to what you remember from the 1990s, but I'm guessing that's, that's been a bit of a shift as well, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. So talk about like volume of spending. Like obviously if people are seeing their, their pets, dogs, especially as, as members of the, of the family, what does that mean about their willingness to, to splurge? Yeah, well, I've actually got um, a ton of data. Um, obviously, we're not going to share all of it in uh, in this podcast. So I'm going to talk a little bit generally to begin with. But for your information, I have actually got data that's been broken out according to whether a dog owner, for example, has engaged in daycare, or they're purchasing um, a walker service on a regular basis, or they're purchasing grooming services, and of course, training. So we can absolutely get into some of those differences a little bit later, but just, just at a high level, you know, 73% of pet owners are buying treats right now, 62% wow. are purchasing toys on a regular basis. 54% of dog owners purchase specialty food 
um, while 41% buy store brands. And then further down the list, we're finding things like medicine and pet sundries, such as grooming supplies, bedding, accessories, apparel, and of course, training aids. Spend is actually comparable across most segments. So overall, 76% of pet owners in the US spend less than $100 per month on pet items. But think about it, you know, for 45% of owners, that adds up to anything between $600 and $1,200 per year. But Mm -hmm. 20% of our respondents spend double that rate. So they're up to $2,400 annually. In terms of where they're shopping, though, so what we call omni-channel retailers, so those are retailers that offer both store and e-com or mail order, the purchases for pet-related products are still outpacing online. So individually, it might surprise you to know that Walmart tops the list of retailers for pet products. 66% of our respondents have shopped for pet products there in the past year. In the specialty retailers, PetSmart, about 62% of our respondents have shopped there. 56 have shopped at Petco. And I was surprised 44% have shopped at Chewy.com, which you know is a, an, wow. on, an online only. Yeah. Does that surprise you? It surprises me that it's that high. I didn't realize Chewy had that reach. I mean, because 44% of any large group is a massive amount, right? And they certainly advertise kind of quite niche. And if you, the first time you order from them, there's all kinds of uh, discount codes and refer a friend and all that good stuff. But um, I mean, I think, I think they're doing a good job. So, I mean, there's all of these, <laughs> these hundreds of millions and billions of dollars being spent on pets. 20% mm-hmm. of the pet population is spending a, a good chunk of money per month. What yeah. are some of the key factors that they're using when they're making their buying decisions? Right. Well, there's, there's lots of things <laughs> that go into that for sure. And when it comes to deciding, if we just think about food for a second, when it comes to deciding what to feed their pets, we found that about half of all owners actually look to recommendations from the veterinarian. Right, That's the first place that half of our respondents will go to seek advice. While 37% said that they seek advice from friends and family, about a third of respondents said that they typically use product reviews to strongly influence their selection of pet foods. And then when we asked them about you know, how they try new products, about 21% of owners said that they were influenced by either a coupon, you know, a sale or a special discount. Those of us sort of living and obviously listening in this case on a podcast in the digital world, you know, coupons seem a bit anachronistic maybe, but then in the digital age, of course, they're doubling as sort of discount codes. And if you think about probably your own uh, consumer research that you do, if you're thinking about buying a, you know, a high ticket item, I bet you often are looking for the availability of codes, right? Discount codes, find me a discount code for this product. So it seems like that's what we do as consumers generally, and it absolutely applies to pet foods. And 20% of respondents say that they're looking for more attribute based um, benefits so they're looking for things like nutritional benefits that's a that's a, a key driver uh, particularly for food and then you're going to find reviews friend recommendations and even um, samples you know if somebody gives you a free sample of a food at a, at a specialty pet retailer you're, you're probably going to take it try it and if the pet likes it you might buy it again right so what i'm taking away from this because so many of our listeners are in the service industry yeah they're going to their vet they're going to their friends and they're looking at reviews And so that's huge. That's huge for our industry because I think so often it's ignored. It's let's put up a good website and we'll say the right things and we'll put up some nice videos, which is all good, but they want to hear it from somebody else. They kind of want that social proof is what I'm hearing, right? Yes. And I think that's increasingly true of most consumer behaviors. I mean, I feel even if you don't purchase through social media, you absolutely are looking for reviews. You're even the element of reviews on, uh, say, an Amazon.com page. I mean, I think we've all kind of learned to look down and see the see how many stars a you know rating yep. a product has. That's just part of our consumer behavior these days. So if you think about you know word of mouth, that's absolutely you know a key part of that. It just happens to be that social media is increasingly the way that we are able to kind of amplify what was previously a conversation just between a few friends. Okay. So I want to ask you about how these pet owners are interacting with advertising because we do a lot of advertising. We teach people how to do advertising. I want to figure out how they're interacting with advertising, but let's take a quick break. Stay with us, folks. We're going to come back here 
with Adrian here in just a second and learn how pet owners are actually viewing advertising. So stay right with us. It's designerpetsweaters.com. Hand-knitted designer sweaters for your precious pup or cool cat. Beautiful couture patterns for your pets, including custom-knitted formal wear, casual wear, yachting, and even sports-themed. Many designer pet sweaters include feathered tammy hats, top hats, and a lot of sparkle. Each sweater includes leg loops, front paw sleeves, and leash opening. Visit designerpetsweaters.com to order your four-legged fashions today. Your pets will stay warm for the winter and be runway ready. Large or small, we fit them all. Designerpetsweaters.com Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com <laughs> All right, folks, we are back, and we're with Adrian Tennant, who's the Vice President of Insights at Big Eye, which is an advertising agency who has recently published, and it's in the show notes for those that, uh, that want to go check this out, who's recently published a study on the behavior of, of pet owners, how they view their pets, how they're buying things. And so I want to ask you, Adrian, I know you guys learned a lot in this study about how how these pet owners are interacting with different advertising formats. Can you give me some insight into that? Yes, uh, and you'll appreciate it. Big Eye, you know, we're a marketing communications agency, so it's in our interest to better understand how pet owners are interacting with the various advertising formats that are out there. And importantly, you know, on what kinds of devices. So, you know, a headline from the report was that more than a third of pet owners prefer to engage with advertisements on their smartphone. And if they think about it, smartphones really are omnipresent these days. The use of a smartphone seems to pervade every corner of our lives. They're the most available, convenient, and immediate point of access to information. So it's perhaps not surprising in that context that actually the number we found was 38% of pet owners said that they indicated the smartphone was their preferred device for engaging with advertisements. Well, you know, for 28% of pet owners, it's still the television, right? And for about a quarter, it's a more traditional laptop or desktop computer. Interesting. I mean, so cell phones are winning then, obviously. Yeah. I mean, we do see some generational differences in device usage. So I'd say a few listeners, you know, the most notable variations to think about based on age for owners um, that are younger than age 35 which in our study, about 47% said they were most willing to engage with advertisements on their smartphones. Whereas those aged 45 and older tend to lean more towards traditional TV. I mean, they're still using smartphones, but they're just slightly more inclined to watch ads on TV. Well, um, you know, we also notice that there's some variations based on where a pet owner lives. So although the smartphone absolutely dominates kind of across the range, pet owners in suburban areas were about 12 percentage points less likely than owners in rural areas to engage with ads on their phones. TV is actually the least likely to be engaged with by urban pet owners compared to those in suburban and rural areas. So you can you can think about, you know, what life looks like in a rural area versus, you know, a very built up downtown metro urban area. So it sounds like, yeah, if, if you're in any sort of uh, population center, optimizing everything that you do for the mobile experience is pretty important, right? I would agree. And again, you know, although we saw that 41% of owners said they like TV commercials, you know, as a, as a preferred format, when you combine Facebook, Instagram, um, social media influencers, other paid social, I mean, that accounts to it for over a third of the preference. So then you add video into that mix, it's very clearly indicating that video ads, right, produced for display on smartphones are the most likely to resonate with certainly the millennial pet owners, but certainly urban and suburban owners too. Was there an age group that is spending the most on their pets? 
You know what? There actually is, and it might surprise you to know, that it's the youngest owners in our study. So those aged 25 to 34 are consistently spending more, on average, for their pets than all other age groups. And I think it has a lot to do with... We remember we, start, we talked a little bit at the top of the show about the humanization of our pets. These millennials, for sure, we know... They've been in the workforce a while now, but they are choosing to delay major life decisions like purchasing their first home or having children so, or st starting a family. So in that context, you know, I, I feel like a lot of them are, um, are becoming dog parents, right? And the dog becomes kind of the child for a while. And so yeah. that interest in pet products and services from those younger owners is reflected in what we call their, they're the most engaged pet parents right now. So you start to see things like the purchase of costumes, right, for your dog. That group tends to be the ones that are doing the, the bulk of the purchasing there because they're looking at their dogs as kids. And of course, they've got an instant Instagrammable moment uh, when they purchase the costume for the dog, right? Because you know it's going to be social within seconds of being purchased. Yeah. So I'm just looking at my own business and I don't have the hard data to back this up, but right. um, when we started our business 13, 14 years ago, I would say that the majority of the people that hired us were probably in the 35 to 55, 60 age range. That was the majority. Nowadays, the majority of our clients are right in that age range, and, and we're, we're a premium service provider as, as far as training. Our average training cost is about $2,000. That's about our average, and so we're right in that 25 to 35 range. We even get a lot of people that are 20, 22, 23, which mm -hmm. I read in a different study that 18 to 25 is actually the highest percentage of dog-owning individuals out there. But yeah, I found that 25 to 35 is now probably our biggest demographic of people that are buying our training, but they typically don't have the same money that somebody in their 50s is going to have. And so for us, a big deal, as we've noticed this shifting demographic of how people are spending on their dogs, what we've noticed is that the better we've done at making it easier to pay with either technology, just very easy invoicing systems or payment plans has made it that our conversion rates are much higher because that demographic of 25 to 35, they're buying a lot, but they don't have the same income as the 50-year-old, right. but they're, they're willing to spend a higher percentage of their income if we can just make it easier for them. That's what I've seen in my business. It sounds like the data might be backing that up. Is that right? Yeah, I think you're definitely onto something there. You know, if we talk about training very specifically, among our respondents, about 12% are signed up for a trainer, either for exercise and or obedience. And we found that 57.5% um, uh, identified themselves as female, 42.5% therefore male. When we looked at the regions in which those selecting training live, about 20% live in the Midwest, 14% live in the Northeast, 40.8% live in the South, and 25.4% wow. live in the West. So it seems like people into, who want to have their dogs trained, the South seems like a really good market to be in. Or if you look at it the other way, um, there's room, there's definitely room for others in the other uh, regions of the US for sure. Interesting. And, and so right. you said that the people purchasing training are women. Is that what you said? Yeah, it looked like in just slightly more. So 57.5% of respondents um, said they were, but they were buying training identified as female in the study. Yeah. I think in our case, it's even heavier skewed. Our company, we're closer to about 70% are, are women that are buying. Wow. And I've noticed that for a while that I think it's because it's more of a premium service. I think in a lot of homes, the woman is generally the one making the bigger ticket decisions about what the family is going to purchase. And so I wonder if that might skew like a, a company that does a lot of lower end group classes and stuff like that. I wonder if it would skew differently. I don't know. Inter but that's interesting. Are there other insights towards like, because we do get a lot of dog trainers listening to this show, but there's a lot of pet sitters, dog walkers, veterinarians, stuff yep. like that. Were there other yeah. specific things, some really nice takeaways from those industries that you guys found? Yeah, actually, you know, let me share a few with you and stop me when you've had enough. <laughs> um, we did find, st just sticking with training for a moment, we asked people to identify kind of which, uh, what type of an area they lived in. Of those that have a training um, service, 13.7 said they live in a rural area. 
53.4% live in a suburban area, and about 33% live in an urban area. So it definitely skews suburban, followed by urban, mm-hmm. and then rural as a, a very distant third. Sticking with training, this was super interesting to us. 71% of those people who are using training are also signed up to some kind of pet-related subscription service. To give you an idea, the national average is 37.8%. So not quite double, but getting there. So 35 are using some kind of health product or supplement subscription service. 44% are signed up to receive a toy or accessory on a regular basis. 43% are doing some kind of food subscription service. And 37% are getting treats through the mail on a regular basis. Wow. I mean, that tells me that if if you're a trainer, and I I imagine it would probably be pretty similar if people are hiring dog walkers, pet sitters. But yeah, if you're in that industry, maybe finding an affiliate program with a a subscription service and making a few extra bucks through an affiliate program might might be a, a smart way to make a few extra bucks, right? Right. And something I think will be interesting to you, Ty, I think I've heard some of your sponsors in the past. We found we were very interested in the use of cannabidiol or CBD, right? Because this is an emerging trend absolutely amongst uh, human consumers. But we wanted to know specifically, you know, of pet owners, how many people were using CBD for the, or CBD products for their pets? Now, the national average is 17%, which is just a couple of percentage points higher than if you ask humans if they're using CBD on themselves, which I think in the Harris poll, which is the most recently published one, is about 14%. Amongst wow. amongst pet owners who have, who have a training service, thirty one and a half percent are currently using CBD on their pets. I just want to run that by you wow. again. Compared to the national average, which is seventeen percent, for those who have training, thirty one point five percent are using CBD products. Thirty seven percent who don't currently use CBD are open to its use in the future. About a quarter of all our respondents who have training uh, do not use and would not use in the future, so they're going to be a long-term holdout, and about 6.8% are still unsure. But that is actually uh, pretty surprising and notable. So back to your point about you know partnerships that trainers, groomers, walkers, daycare owners might want to consider, there's something there for sure with CBD. Yeah, I, I can see this going both ways, that if, if you're a service provider, you could probably to make a few extra dollars or maybe make a significant income by promoting other products. But also it tells you that the people that are using those, you know, that, that there's a higher percentage of those people that, uh, that are also wanting to purchase other services. And so that's, uh, boy, that's interesting to me, like how significant it is that, you know, somebody that's doing training is also doing CBD, is also having a subscription service, is also getting treats in the mail. I actually never would have, uh, never would have thought or, or realize that. That's pretty cool. Yeah, so Ty, one of the other things that we saw was differences between those services. So if we just think about training, grooming, daycare, and walkers, interestingly, although we saw most spend on services in the South pretty consistently, walking, uh, having your dog walked, is most popular in the Northeast of the US. So while the South came in kind of top, regions for all the other services for some reason people who live in the northeast have more need for dog walkers what's that about i wonder do you think it's because there's a lot more urban areas where they've got an hour and an hour and a half of commute each way and they just don't have the time is that what do you think it could be i think that's definitely plausible you know we found as well if just just thinking about walkers the distribution by sort of household income is pretty broad right so in some in some categories that we looked at higher household incomes indicated a uh, more of a propensity to purchase. But in walking, it really was kind of across the board. I mean, the, the lowest household income that we, that we rank is 35000 to 49 per annum. And 10, 10% of respondents kind of fell in that bucket. But really from that point on, from the 50 to 75, 75 to 100, 100 to 120, and 120 and above, you know, is pretty broadly the same need regardless of household income. And again, thinking about walkers, you know, I mentioned before that there was a high propensity for uh, those people who have dog training to be signed up to a pet-related subscription service. This is actually much higher amongst those people who have a walker. Actually, 80% 
are also signed up to a pet-related subscription service, right? And just to remind you, that's compared to a national average of 37.8. So they're definitely, uh, these folks who have the dogs walked are also, again, investing in their pets, want them to have the absolute best of everything. And again, although not quite as dramatic as some of the others, 53 Actually, it is pretty dramatic. Uh, just looking at the use of CBD among respondents who select walkers, 53.2%, so that's over half, are currently using CBD on their pet. So that's way more than the 17% national average. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, because, I mean, this is especially interesting to me because I've got a client that uh, is involved with CBD, and she says, hey, we should put together a series where we can promote CBD to your list. Because we've got a big list of dog owners. We've got 45,000 dog owners on our list. And so she's saying, hey, we need to promote some CBD to them. And so I've actually been like, just wondering, well, how how prevalent is CBD? This I had no idea that 17% total, let alone 30-something mm -hmm. people doing training, are all switching <laughs> CBD. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, again, I, I'd like to refer the listeners back to the full study. And we actually do go pretty in depth on the CBD topic because it is just so fascinating to us. You know, one of the complications about around CBD at the moment is, you know, we've got the uh, Food and Drug Administration on the one hand uh, with one point of view about CBD. And we've got the FTC on the other, you know, determining whether we can even advertise the product. So one is sort of about how the product's made, how it's distributed and what claims you can have the other is where you can advertise it and we really need them to sync up <laughs> not to get political but we do need the fda and the ftc to kind of agree a path forward for cbd products because consumer demand is way ahead of where legislation is right now hmm, interesting so for people listening that want to learn more about this study like i say we're going to link it up in the show notes is that is that the best way that people should get in touch with you guys and see what you guys are up to or is there another way that people should see what your company is up to I appreciate that, Ty. Yeah, so the easiest way to get uh, access to this particular study is to go to our agency website, which is bigeyeagency.com. Then you go to Insights, and you'll find the pet report right there. You can also contact us via that page. I'll also give you my email address in case everybody wants to reach out to me directly. It's a tenant. I'll spell that, A-T-E-N-N-A-N-T, -N 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 at bigeyeagency.com. That's awesome. Adrian, thank you so much for being on the show today. This is, uh, I love data. And so um, I don't think it's used enough in our industry. I think a lot of uh, service providers are ignoring it and going with their gut. And so it's, it's really nice to see data showing new things, but also confirming things and, and, and making me think in different ways. So I appreciate you so much for being on the show. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ty. It's been a great pleasure. And uh, again, I'm really inspired to see how your listeners use this data going forwards. Yeah. And I hope uh, for those listening, I hope you do use it and uh, head over. Like I say, go down in the show notes, grab the, uh, the study there, check it out. I've been reading it this morning and there's a lot of really cool stuff in there. And they've, the page on it has like a different podcast that gives more in, in depth and there's videos on there and there's some cool stuff on there. So, so check it out. Also make sure you're heading over to petliferadio.com and listening to all the episodes of Six Figure Dog Business and head over to my website too, tiethedogguide.com and see how we are helping pet business owners around the country to grow their business. Thanks again to Adrian and we'll be talking with you guys soon. Thanks for listening. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.